Thank you. Welcome. Aloha. Thanks so much for joining us at ThinkTech Hawaii. We appreciate taking the time to join us. Take a look, take a listen, and feel free to share your thoughts with us. We'll take them into account in coming weeks and episodes. And today we have the great fortune of having with us Professor Vernelia Randall, Professor Emerita of the University of Dayton School of Law, and one of the leading national and international scholars on race, racism, and the law. And Professor Randall's racism.org site is a compilation of some of the most comprehensive collections of articles on the subject that you'll find anywhere. Jeff Portnoy, First Amendment and Constitutional Scholar, Litigation Attorney and Partner at one of our most respected senior firms, Kate Shuddy, and David Louie, former Attorney General of the State of Hawaii, Senior Litigation Attorney and Partner at the Kobayashi Sugita firm, also here in Honolulu. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, we thought we'd take a dabble since we're two months from the midterm elections and some thoughts about what issues do you think might have some impact on these upcoming midterm elections? Professor Randall, you want to start us off? Any thoughts? Well, I definitely think the uh, abortion issue will have an impact on the election. I also think that an issue important to me won't have an impact on election, and that is the uh, the uh, allowing of police to kill black men and women with no real repercussion. So, I mean, an abortion is an important issue, but racial justice is also. And unfortunately, I don't think it'll be uh, that it'll have an impact on election. I think a major issue, and I didn't think it was going to be, at least with independence, is what's going on at Mar-a-Lago and the subpoena issue as more and more is leaked out about Trump's lawlessness and carelessness, depending upon how you want to look at it, in taking documents that he had no right to take. He and his lawyers, and I hope that there's going to be disbarment proceedings against at least one or more attorneys who lied on an affidavit that there were no documents at Mar-a-Lago. And depending upon the scope of the uh, characterization of the documents, top secret, super secret, whatever all the terms are, I think people have begun, and I didn't think this was going to happen, have begun to turn on Trump and the games that his Republican colleagues continue to play in the Senate. And so, you know, I've been on the show a lot and I've been one of the more pessimistic people about what I thought was going to happen uh, in November. But I, I'm beginning to change. The polls are beginning to change. Some of the elections that have occurred over the last three months have shown that the abortion issue and some of these Trump issues are beginning to sway independence. And I think it's now very more than likely the Democrats will keep the Senate. And maybe, and I'm not predicting this, maybe continue to maintain a one or two vote margin in the House. So, you know, I think it's hard to predict everybody without knowing what's going to happen in the next four to six weeks. But the shoe continues to drop. So I agree abortion will bring women out. I think of forgiving the student debt, which I think is very controversial, but I think it's going to bring out a lot of younger people who will vote Democratic, and I think Mar-a-Lago. So those three things, I think. And a little bit, you know, the change in the gas prices. Inflation is kind of steady. So we'll just see how important the economy is. It's normally the most important issue, but I think it's being overwhelmed by these other issues. So my, my take on this is, is that the biggest factor is whether independence will be so turned off by the anti-democratic rhetoric and the anti-democratic forces that have gathered behind Trump, uh, the deniers of the election, the people who are putting themselves out there and say, you know what, um, I, I don't care what the election is, I'm ready to declare it for Trump. 
uh, if I get elected as, a, as the uh, elections official. Um, these are such extreme views and so anti-democratic uh, that I have been very pessimistic uh, of late, but I am, I, the, the real question is, is what is the basic nature of the American people? H have the culture wars, which has been the driving force uh, of, of the anti-democratic forces in Trump, have those culture wars reached the tipping point where it is a bridge too far and the basic decency of the American people will, as a group, reassert themselves and reassert itself so that, so that we can have uh, the Democrats come forth and succeed in an election. I mean, it's very difficult. I think it's very close. Uh, we're on a razor's edge right now. Um, and and the, the problem is, is, is that the Democrats, uh, who obviously I support, uh, you know, they're always for process and fairness and things like that. And those things really don't matter to the GOP a whole heck of a lot. They just want control. They want to win. They don't mind the cost and they don't mind the cost of being anti-democratic. So I, I consider the, the anti-democratic forces uh, and sentiments as the biggest piece. And I'm just hoping uh, that that will carry the day. You know, what, you, what you're looking at is two completely opposite political realities. One is gerrymandering, which gives the Republicans tremendous advantage in most of the House races uh, between the two mountain ranges, the Rockies and the Alleghenies. And the other is turnout. And I think the turnout issue is what the Democrats have got to hope and, uh, you know, hope that the independents and the Democratic voters show up. And normally in midterm elections, turnout is very low. And if it's low again, then gerrymandering will rule the day. So we're just going to have to see how uh, excited voters are going to be. And if you look at the one race in New York, where it was won on this sole issue of abortion, according to most commentators, that's because of turnout. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, people are not that motivated during the midterm elections to vote. And I, I, you know, I'm sorry, I have to agree with Professor Randall. I think race is a total non-issue come this November. It's been superseded by everything else. You know, that well, we're it's never about been on the air. Now, let's be, let's, let's not pray like it's been superseded. It's never been on the national agenda except for some sort of superficial point. I feel like, because I'm, I'm a far, far left person, and I am not a Democrat. And most years, I haven't voted. Uh, when I do vote, I vote some other party besides Republican and Democrat. Okay. So, and we always get blamed with spoiling the, the election. But the problem is I have value and I don't want to be forced into the position of reneging on my own values. So someone I don't want, Democrat or Republican, gets in. There's a lot of people in my, in my position and I don't know that Democrats have done enough to win a lot of us over. I'm still not sure about what. So Professor Randall, what, what do you I think? I, 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 you know, I know the stake, but I also know the stake of going down the road of voting against your value. That once you go down that road, there's always another election in which there's always someone you know, we've got to get this other party in. And then you spend four years hating yourself for having voted for them. So I think that the Democrats, if they don't want a tight election, they might not need us to win, but they might. And I think they need to start thinking about not how to appeal to the middle, but how to appeal to the extreme. Professor Randall, I have a question for you. Do you think if race is not a big issue, and, and my, my own view is, is that race only becomes an issue when there's a crisis, or, or, and even though there was this shooting the other day, 
it's not a big enough crisis because it's unfortunately the new normal that another black person unarmed in his bed was killed uh, by a by a police invading his home. But my question to you is, is do you think if race is not front and center with a crisis, that there will be a less turnout of people of color, of black voters, uh, because of just the dynamics that maybe that that other issues don't matter as much. I, I'm curious as to your viewpoint. I think, first of all, I think that many black voters are very conservative. And so I think that I don't fit into the black voter <laughs> a norm in terms of my views. I think I would be an extreme person for a black voter. Uh, but I do think that, uh, I I think that what that there's this there's this whole conservative strange of a range of black voters who are appalled by by Trump, but who may still be voting Republican. I think there's the whole race race brings black voters out, but so does economic issues. Uh, and I, and so for instance, I think, and this on the websites that I'm on, uh, which are mostly occupied by black voters, there's sort of a disgust over the student loan thing because black voters have a higher student loan debt level and $10,000 does little it doesn't even begin to help them skin to deal with that load and get rid of the accumulated interest. So I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction over, with, uh, with based on the economy, based on uh, uh, econo uh, other economic issues. But I also think that uh, Black voters most black voters are middle of the road and will not want Trump to get in. You know, I, and so I, they'll I, they'll turn out of. I think they'll turn yeah. out to vote because of that. I mean, you know, the reality is in a midterm election, the black vote is insignificant because it's it's localized in a few major metropolitan areas and in in areas in the South. But in half the states, the black vote in midterms is totally insignificant. I mean, how many African Americans are in Montana and Idaho? And, you know, we can go through state by state by oh, state. Yeah. So, you know, in a national election, it's huge when you're dealing with popular vote and electoral college and everything else. So, you know, yes, you need yeah. let's let's take a state like Georgia. Their black votes are critical in Georgia, but they're not critical in, 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 in the congressional district in Philadelphia or in New York City or, in, you know, San Francisco or Los Angeles. So, That's you true. know, I, I, I think the reality is it's those, it's those white middle-class suburban voters who are gonna make the difference in these midterm elections. That, I mean, that's my my reality in the midterms. I have no question with you, Professor Randall, in a national election, it's really, really important. But I think this time around, not sure. I think that's a good point about the midterms. So I, the other thing I've noticed about these the election cycle, we just had our primary, was the influence of money. Uh, did not make a big difference in Hawaii uh, this time. Uh, there was tremendous negative ads, a uh, huge influx of millions of dollars in a small market here. But, but I have a question, Jeff, because Jeff has been a foremost advocate for uh, the First Amendment. And I have always disagreed with the Citizens United case that said that speech is money and the influx and outsized influence of big money in influencing elections. I don't know that that's gonna happen. I don't know 
uh, what's going to happen in this midterm, but I, I, I'm curious as to whether or not either of the other two uh, uh, are concerned about the outsized influence of money uh, that well, we continue you to you know, have. whether I'm concerned or not, or whether I think it's legal, are two different things. Yeah, I, I the problem I had with Citizen United was the finding that a corporation is a person. That, that's a fiction that to me is, is absurd. And if it's going to be a person, then apply it across the board to yeah, everything kill else. It when it does something wrong. Right. Yeah. So, but, but as David pointed out, I mean, money's, money has always influenced elections, even in the 1700s. It may, you know, may not have been as much. And frankly, you know, people get all upset because, you know, these people are Republicans and they're given millions of dollars. There's plenty of Democrats that are given millions of dollars. So it's the way the money's used, David, you know, and, and, and I was offended by those ads, uh, but on a free speech basis, and you know, I was involved in the major case here dealing with political ads. Um, I'm a free speech person and, you know, people can agree or disagree and you and I have disagreed. Uh, I, I, I know it's a very controversial issue, not just in politics, but in everything else. But I'm still of the belief, and it's not going to change, that, you know, words can hurt. But I don't believe that there should be a government that says what is or is not appropriate, except for certain things which I've always agreed with, like pornography, like defamation, and things like that. So, you know, money being poured into political races. Hey, go out there and raise it. That's just part of the reality. And we know that there's a recent <clears throat> mega PAC group, which has received a donation of $1.6 billion. Billion dollars. And has appointed the former head of the Federalist Society <clears throat> to run it. So we know that the targeting of federal judgeships continues to be a very, very high priority for the Republican Party. <laughs> one, of the th one of the things the Republicans did, or the conservatives, I don't want to say, <clears throat> is uh, so I was uh, is starting that Federalist Society and starting chapters in all the school and making it uh, a, a, it a a fraternity, a sorority type situation, training up lawyers through law school with the conservative mindset and then getting them jobs and then helping each other and and setting themselves up. Uh, I mean, that's uh, brilliant. Once again, the Democrats are left at the starting gate and the conservatives have figured things out. I and you just understand. indicated. In 1990. Go ahead. No, no, you go, please. I was just going to say back in when I first started teaching and <clears throat> I, I kind of, I looked at the Federalist Society and said stuff about, you know, this is going to be a real threat. Their threat, they were a threat back in 1990 in law schools to minority law professors. Uh, they, uh, they, they petitioned against minority law professors. They, they did all, they, and they were encouraged to, uh, to do that. And I never could understand over the years why the Democrats didn't develop some similar network of training um, lawyers within their value system, but but here we are. Well, you know, I mean, I went to a law school, uh, I went to Duke and uh, in the early 70s, and it was a school that five years earlier was completely dominated by Southern white males and very conservative. And then in the late 60s and early 70s began to change fairly dramatically. 
And of course, now it's a completely different makeup, uh, you know, whether it's women versus men and, or minorities versus whites. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of very conservative law schools around the country that have cropped up and are putting out lots of very conservative lawyers. And even in the major schools, I mean, look at the Supreme Court and the conservative majority. Where did they all go to law school? <laughs> They're all from Yale and Harvard. So, I mean, it's not like it's only happening in, uh, you know, Liberty Law School or whatever. <laughs> so which are the voting blocks that might make some difference in these upcoming elections? And it may vary from state to state. Well, I don't want, you know, I've already indicated, I think it's going to be the same group that uh, put Biden in, along with, of course, this time it won't be the African-American community, but I think it's the white middle-class woman and, and, you know, and, and younger voters. I think that's going to be the two groups that are going to have to show up in various places because of the gerrymandering that's gone on. And, you know, we talk about 400 and what is it, David? You're the, uh, is it 435 House seats? There may be only be 40 that are really at play, yeah. right? The other 400 are done <laughs> even before we start. <laughs> Maybe yeah, less than 40. Swing votes. There's only a few swing, swing districts. So um, I don't disagree with uh, Jeff. I, I, I think in the majority of, of the races, uh, it's already set. I mean, they're, 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 they're already done. Um, I, I think the main thing is in, in places like Georgia, where, where you know, voter turnout is huge and um, it's, it's gonna be really important. It, uh, it's interesting, you know, I, I mean, Kansas is deep red and, and Kansas voted against abortion. Um, I, I look at those things and then Alaska just voted in favor of uh, the Democratic Native American woman uh, part of that is, is that I think people are tired of Sarah Palin and she has distinguished. Hey, it's not over yet. Yes, I know. She's going to run again and maybe she'll. Maybe no, that race isn't out. over yet. Oh, OK, that's a runoff. And Palin, if you look at David, if you look at the voting in Alaska, there were like, I don't know, 13 or 15 candidates. It, it, it's it's not unlikely that Palin's going to win that race. Okay, when you look so at all the other people who have dropped out and where their votes are going to go. But, you know, hopefully not so. Hopefully not so. But but I, I mean, it's it's a mixed bag as to as to what happens. I think the most important thing is getting the voter turnout. Uh, the problem has been, I think, with the with the Democrats and the progressive uh, and people on the extreme left is, is that there is no one uniting ideology. OK, and, right. and the uniting ideology of the Federalists and the conservatives have been, we hate the new society. We hate the new culture. We hate the rise of giving rights to people who, no long, who never had rights before in the 1950s. And we don't like it. And we want things to go back the way they were. So that has been a uniting ideology. Uh, and there has not been a uniting ideology of the Democrats because the Democrats have been, well, we need to be fair. We need to uphold the rule of law. We need to uphold the Constitution. Those are not propositions that get people out to vote, okay? They're just too rational. I think that the, I, I agree that the Democrats don't have a uniting ideology, and I, I'm not so sure that. I think that the values that the Democrats articulate I don't know. I, I I don't know whether I think that's the, the Democrats. I think Democrats say that, but that they that they too have the idea we need to win. And and so then they do stuff to win. And sometimes that's fair and uh but I think like that. This is an argument for why we need more party, why we need a system that allows representation in the government of different, of multiple parties. 
Uh, unless the Democrats want to adopt an ideology that will get people on board, they, except for national elections, I mean, yeah, they, they might be find themselves, you know, at a complete disadvantage in, uh, on local, more and more of a disadvantage on local level. Well, Professor Randall, uh, you know, I've talked to you about this. Uh, I'm not sure you want the Italian system either. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, a multiple or the Israeli system. We can yeah. go through country by I mean, country that have multiple parties. <laughs> I, I agree with Jeff on that. Too. We can go through a list of systems that we will start listing systems that work, and that just like we the the just like we designed a system that we thought would work, we could design a system that would work better for who we are and give us multiple representation. There's no reason, especially when you consider the fact that we really only have a one party system. We have two branches of the same party, capitalism. And Democrats so represent capitalism, Republicans represent capitalism. And so we only have one party, just like communists have multiple branches of their party come on come so, on the republicans the republicans say that we got a bunch of socialists a small number yeah, of socialists yeah, yeah. in congress come on <laughs> okay so in our last yeah, yeah. Uh, that that is that's the thing that republicans beat democrats and people with who don't know any better okay in our last minute final thoughts what words of wisdom, things to think about, would you leave people with? David? Get out and vote and encourage everybody to vote so that we at least have better turnout and better representation of people's thoughts. Get your passport up to date. That's my <laughs> advice. <laughs> and Jeff, on that note, thank you all so much. Great insights, great thoughts, great humor. Come back and join us again in a couple of weeks. Think Tech Hawaii, Russell Randall, David Louie, Jeff Portnoy, thank you all. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs>